Hello guys and welcome to another video in Run GB Fighter Combat School. A few days ago in one of the Young with Ram episodes there was some discussion going on about um, heavy planes and light planes and which should die better and which should climb better. Now, if you go up, uh, back to my how to climb video, you'll see that a zoom climb and a um, sustained climb are totally different things. Zoom climbing is um, really related to plane weight and aerodynamics and not so much about engine uh, power. In a zoom climb, what's bringing you up is inertia, not your engine power. In a similar fashion, there are two different uh, kind of dives. There are power dives and there are simple dives. Power dives are those though made with full engine power. And normal dives are those where the engine power is useless <coughs> or is simply not used. There's a concept here and that's in a dive when you go over your top speed your engine stops helping you moving forward. Um, in a dive when you go over your designed plane top speed the engine stops working in your favor simply because you are over your top speed. Your, the drag your plane is suffering is much higher than the thrust your engine is producing. As a result, in very high speed power dives, engine power is also totally <laughs> senseless, doesn't help. Um, as a result, heavy planes with good aerodynamics, don't forget this because it's important, are better at diving and zooming, and light planes are not. Seems counterintuitive and this is the purpose of this video, to give you very easy to understand mathematical uh, proofs about the lighter planes being <coughs> less efficient in dives and zooms. I'm going to take the instance of a dive, but the same, exactly the same belongs to, um, to a zoom. So let's get started. Now, before anything, you have to understand that in a dive, your plane is subjected to forces, and those forces is are those um, forces which are going to make your plane accelerate or decelerate, accelerate faster or slower. We are going to go into this in a second later, but first, let's start with the simple things. Dive me mechanics. What affects your plane in a straight 90 degree down dive? So your plane is pointing directly downwards. There are several forces that are affecting you. Some of them are acting in your favor, some of them are acting against you. The force that is acting against you, the force that is trying to slow you down from your dive, is drag. Drag is a function of speed and aerodynamics. Drag increases exponentially, exponentially with the speed, so the faster you go, the much high, higher drag you are suffering. And aerodynamics is a constant for any plane you are at. I mean, each plane has its own drag, its own aerodynamics. Um, so the better aerodynamics, of course, the less drag you are going to suffer. Acting in your favor are two forces in a 90 degree straight down dive. This is an oversimplification, this is just straightly done. It's the same in every dive, but it's the easier to see in a 90 degrees one. So, there are two forces that are going to act in your favor. The first one is gravity. Gravity is mass times g. g is the acceleration that you suffer because of gravity. It's a constant at sea level, which is 9.81 meters second squared. But of course, the higher you go, the less gravity is going to be. That constant varies depending on your distance from the Earth um, center. But oh, let's say it's 9.8 meters per second squared, and let's li leave it at that. I mean. The, the, the variance is not really important. The second um, force that is affecting you and is working in your favor to accelerate you in the dive is engine power, but as I told you, engine power stops actually working uh, after your top speed has been reached. Actually, in a sense, if, you're, uh, if you are over your top speed, the same top speed, if you are much higher than that top speed, your um, 
your propeller is acting as an air brake but we are going to leave that aside we are going to keep this simple okay so we have two forces which are helping us diving which are gravity and uh, engine power and there's one that is acting against you all right cool let's move on moving on we are moving into the new newton laws uh, newton was a very wise man uh, back in the 18th century on England he was a very wise man also was an asshole but that's <laughs> totally uh, 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 out of topic but yeah he was very smart um, one of the laws Newton found that rule um, the real world we live in at least mm, well yeah the real world we live it we live in and we perceive there's then there's the relation re, relative uh, Einsteinian laws uh, with relate relativism and all that stuff but for the day-to-day -day, Newton laws are very accurate okay one of the laws he set in stone back then was that every object subjected to a force is going to accelerate depending on the mass it has so in, in, in an equation you can see that a force is equal to the mass of the object times its the acceleration it uh, suffers uh, translated all the forces acting upon an object added together from form a single force the acceleration you experience is going to be inversely proportional to your mass so translation of the translation if an object is suffering two different forces which are opposite the force the total force that object is going to suffer is the biggest force minus the other one because it's opposite and uh, that total force is going to comply that law that force is equal to mass times acceleration for instance a two kilogram stone subjected to a six newton newton is a unit force you can see there we are subject uh, putting the the numbers in the formula 6 equals uh, 2 times a so we clear a from the equation and we'll have that a is equal to 6 um, divided by 2 so the acceleration that stone subjected to a 6 newton force is going to suffer is of 3 meters per second squared now let's move on to a little picture to better help you better understand what I was telling you about opposing forces so let's say we have an object in this case a beautiful black square <laughs> which is subjected to two opposite forces one to the left one to the right the force acting to the left is four newton strong the other acting to the right is one newton strong you can see the figure there the object one force to the left with four newtons one to the right one newton what the newtonian laws says is that the object that you see above subject to those those two opposite forces will react exactly the same way as the same object subjected to a single force that's equal to all those forces added in this case if we have the leftward and rightward forces we'll have to subtract one two from the another because they are opposite and we'll conclude that the object above will behave exactly the same as if it was subjected to just one force of new uh, th of three newtons which is four newtons minus one this is a constant of physics all the forces acting on an object can be treated as a single force which is equal to all those forces added um, of course you'll constantly find that forces don't always work in exactly opposite directions in real life because of course <laughs> they don't <laughs> some are perpendicular etc and that's where angles have to be taken in account and the component of forces in different axes etc 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 but in real world all objects behave as if they were subjected to just one force even when they are subjected to different ones because you only have to add all those forces and the component of those forces which are those forces added together is what determines how the object will behave so I hope this is understood because we are moving forward. So let's back let's go back to our initial diagram. A plane in a 90 degree straight down dive. You can see that we have gravity, engine power and drag. And those forces in each moment are going to be added all the time and the resulting force is what is going to rule 
that plane behavior. So, if gravity and engine power are bigger than drag, the plane will accelerate. If they are equal, the plane won't accelerate nor decelerate. If drag is bigger than gravity and engine power, it decelerates. The bigger the forces uh, in one direction and the smaller the forces in the other one will mean bigger accelerations. Very easy to understand, isn't it? So, okay, now let's move forward and start talking about lighter planes and um, heavier planes. So the situation here is that in a 90 degree straight down dive, the forces favoring the dive are going to be weight and gravity. The force contouring the dive is going to be drag. The total of those forces added, so the weight plus gravity minus drag, is going to be equal to mass times acceleration. A being the acceleration that the plane will experience. So far, so good. Easy to understand. Let's move on to a study case. So this is going to be our study case. Two planes exactly the same aerodynamic shape as each other. One is twice as heavy as the other. Plane 1 is 5,000 5, kg heavy. Plane 2 is 10,000 kg heavy. The plane shape is exactly the same for both planes, so the aerodynamic drag they are going to suffer is exactly the same at the same speeds. This is an oversimplification because actually there's a difference, but it's very minor and it's um, pretty um, unsubstantial to this instance. And I'm trying to keep this simple, so let's say that the drags are going to be the same, because the shape of the planes is going to be the same. So let's move on. To simplify things even more, let's say that in this study case, none of those planes has its own engine running. Both are idling. So we will have just two forces acting upon them in a 90 degree straight down dive. Gravity and drag. Which are opposite to each other, hence one will contract the other. So in plane 1 we have G1 minus drag equals M1 times A1. G1 is gravity forces on P1, mass, uh, M1 is mass of P1, and A1 is acceleration of P1. Drag is going to be exactly the same in both. In plane 2, we'll have G2 minus drag equals uh, mass of P2 times A2. So far, so good, isn't it? Now, let's move on and start substituting some... Um, numbers by some variables by numbers. Now let's move on and start making these equations. Remember, gravity force is equal to mass times g, and g is equal to 9.8 meters uh, per second squared. So in plane 1 we have the mass of plane 1 times 9.8 minus the drag equal to mass 1 times a1. If we substitute that for numbers, remember plane 1 was 5,000 kg heavy, so we substitute the mass. 5,000 times 8.9.8 uh, minus drag equals to 5,000 uh, times acceleration of plane 1. And as a result, uh, we'll have 49,000 minus drag equals to 5,000 times A1. In plane 2, remember, this is twice as heavy as the first one, so it's 10,000 kilograms heavy. The final equation we reach is 98,000 minus drag equals 5,000 uh, times acceleration of plane 2. So far, so good. Let's move on. Now, let's put a number to drag. Let's say, say that in the given moment we are analyzing this, Drag is 44,000 strong, and as both planes have the same shape, they'll be experiencing the same drag at the same speed, so drag will be the same for both. Let's put that into the equations we had before. Plane 1 will have 49,000 minus 44,000, which is drag, equals to 5,000, which is uh, weight, times A1. If we subtract 49,000 minus 44,000, we have 5,000. So 5,000 equals 5,000 times A1. If we clear A1, A1 is going to be 1 meters per second squared. Let's go to plane 2. Plane 2, remember, was the one that was twice as heavy as the first one. 
Plane 2 is 98,000 minus 44,000 equals to 10,000 times A2. Uh, if we subtract 98,000 minus 44,000, we reach 54,000 equals uh, 10,000 times A2. If we clear A2, we reach the conclusion that acceleration of plane 2 is 5.4 meters per second square. 5 times the acceleration of the other one. So as you can see, the lighter one dives ma much worse than the second one. Much, much worse. Now this is granted for a very high drag. What happens if drag is somewhat lesser? Let's put a smaller number. Let's analyze that. So let's say that drag is lower. The drag is now 9,000 only. So in plane 1, we substitute 9,000 instead of the 44 that we had before. And we reach the conclusion the, that the plane 1 is going to accelerate at 8 meters per second square in the dive. Meanwhile, in plane 2, we substitute exactly the same way and we reach the conclusion that the plane is going to accelerate at 8.9 meters per second square. The second plane, the heavier plane, is still accelerates a lot, mm, well, a lot, quite faster. It's 20%, it's a big difference. <laughs> the thing here is, of course, that the lower the drag goes, the smaller the difference is. But that ha has a lot of sense and meaning, and I will uh, go and elaborate further on that later. Now, we have visited the situation of drag being lower. Now, let's move on on a much higher drag. Much, much, much higher, and see what happens. So, now we have a much higher drag. Drag is equal to 89,000, which is a huge. In plane 1, we'll see that actually our acceleration is going to be negative. The plane is slowing down, because drag is slowing it down. On a heavier plane, we'll see, however, that it is still accelerating. What is what does it mean? That um, the higher the drag is, the better the different the acceleration is for the heavier plane, because the lighter plane is going to be stopped by drag much before than what the uh, second plane is going to. You can see that it's pretty obvious to see that the heavier plane is going to dive much better all the time since the very beginning. And now let's draw some conclusions from the facts I give, gave you in this particular lesson. Let's back to the first uh, picture we saw. Look at drag. Drag is a function of uh, speed and aerodynamics. And it's a function that goes up exponentially with the speed. The faster you go, the much, much bigger drag you get. At very high speeds, drag just shoots over the board. So, in other words, the big drag number you saw before is going to happen all the time in high speed dives. And that is the reason when, why if you point your nose down in a light plane and you're pursuing a heavier plane, the heavier plane will go away like a rocket and you will never ever be able to catch up. This study, of course, covers 90 degrees dives, but believe me, it's the same in any dive you start. Very simple and just uh, depends on components and I wanted to make it simple and not starting doing um, uh, angle calculations and components and all that stuff. But in any dive, it's going to be always the same. The heavier planes will always outpace the lighter one. And if you are wondering if happens the same in a climb, it's exactly the same and the same thing happens. Just do yourself this situation. I could do an analysis and the same thing with mathematics as you saw here, but I don't think I need to spend 20 minutes doing it when you can do it on your own. And if you don't, you can trust me. <laughs> uh, in that situation, all the forces are going to op go opposite to you. The uh, acceleration is always going to be negative always. But it's going to be much more negative in the case of lighter planes than in uh, high heavier planes. In a 90 degree straight up climb, drag is going to go downwards, gravity is going to be downwards and engine power is going to be upwards. But again, engine power in a zoom climb at a very high speed doesn't matter every a, a single bit. And you'll be getting negative accelerations. And you'll see 
you'll see that at very high speeds with very high drags involved, uh, the heavier plane will uh, climb better because it will accelerate, decelerate slower until a threshold at slow speeds where drag is very slow that it actually the uh, lighter plane climbs better. But in some climbs at very high speeds, very high drags, it's always the same. The heavier plane will climb better because inertia is driving it upwards, not engine power. This is the ABC of Woman Zoom. This is the alpha and omega of um, energy fighting, in fact, because this applies to energy conservative movements. If you know your plane can keep your speed up better in dives and zooms than the enemy, just dive and zoom, because he's going to be wasting his energy while you're keeping yours, at least keeping better, because you're slowed down much slower than the other guy. If you have a lighter plane behind you, just don't panic, dive, straight down dive, he will never catch up. If you have a plane that's behind you and is lighter, just zoom climb, he's going to be wasted. Of course you have to stop the zoom at the speeds when it turns into a uh, sustained climb, but we talk about that in the video about climb rates. The thing is, um, heavier planes have an inherent advantage over lighter ones. Of course. This only applies with planes with good aerodynamics, because otherwise a B-17 would be the best fighter role, and it is not the case. But why is not? Well, because in a BB-17, the uh, aerodynamics um, component of the drag is huge. The plane is massive, is incredible big, has four engines, and what's stopping him is more than speed, um, is uh, the aerodynamics. But for small planes, more or less similar, um, uh, aerodynamic shapes, or close enough, I mean, a P-47 doesn't have the same aerodynamics as a Spitfire, for instance, but still, it's close enough that weight is still what matters most. And that's why uh, boom and zoomers are all heavy planes. You will not find a single instance of a boom and zoomer that's not a heavy plane. Not a single one. You will find heavy planes that are not good, good boom and zoomers, but you will never find a, good, a light plane that is a good, good boom and zoomer. Simply because it's light, it can't dive and zoom, because it's going to lose all its speed, it won't accelerate well, and it won't climb well in a zoom climb. So well, I hope this helped you guys understanding why heavy planes are good for doing stuff as the one you are going to see in the video I'm going to link here, which belongs to a totally different um, uh, combat lesson I posted some time ago, um, but pretty much is I mean is what you have seen put into into the real game. So as always, guys, I hope you enjoy. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something. I hope you understood everything. I tried to make it as simple and as easy to understand as possible. And as always guys, thank you very much for watching and see you later.